We're going to talk about uh, sex differences in sleep and sleep apnea. This is a topic um, that I, I, I am interested in and I was asked to speak about. Uh, I think um, pediatric sleep was going to be on and then sex differences, but sex differences won. So this one is the talk for today. We'll do another one on pediatrics. Uh, but I do think that there's some overlap and I'll show you uh, why that is. Okay, so let's get started. Um, objectives for this talk, we're going to do, we're going to discuss some of the influences of, of sex uh, affecting sleep throughout the lifespan. So children all the way to adults, not much in the children's literature, but we'll talk about that. Uh, sleep epidemiology, according to reproductive state, uh, you'll, you'll really get to explore uh, the complexity there and some of the hormonal and physiological conditions. Uh, and why that makes presentations in women a little bit different than men. Okay, so starting from childhood, uh, there's just very, very small, mostly observational studies uh, that say in infancy, boys may sleep a little bit less and have more awakenings. Um, it's really not backed up by very good science. Uh, this is more observational. Um, as we get into childhood, however, some of those themes still stay the same. So longer sleep duration in girls in some studies, earlier bedtime uh, in girls in some studies. And when boys have sleep disturbance, they tend to have more severe behavioral manifestations of them. And then we start to get an adolescence. And here, here is where some of the sex differences may start. Um, girls still might report longer sleep duration, more sleepiness, and earlier wake time. Again, that, that a slight circadian advancement, which may actually be backed up by science. Um, and then if you control for puberty, however, um, uh, in Tanner staging, there's actually very few differences because girls may go through puberty earlier than boys. And so therefore, to take puberty into account, you may not see those differences. And then in adulthood, there's great, greater maturational changes in males, uh, which seems to be consistent. As we know, once puberty starts, we start to see a maturation change in EEG as well as some of the sleep we see, mainly slow wave sleep or non-REM three sleep or delta sleep, <laughs> lots of different ways to say that. So uh, what happens in cha uh, challenging conditions? Okay, so let's take sleep deprivation, for example. If you see healthy young women, compare them to men, uh, and you put them back into a sleep opportunity, there's a greater delta response. So what happens with sleep deprivation? You don't sleep, you go back to sleep, and what, what kinds of sleep do you get? Usually there's a robust delta response or non-REM3 response. Um, or slow wave response, and that seems to be a little bit more unhealthy on women compared to men. And in depression, we see more sleep architectural uh, differences in men versus women. The theory is that perhaps there needs to be a greater bio biological flexibility and adaptation in women under challenging conditions. And let me illustrate why that is. Uh, so for example, oh, my illustrations don't look very good here, so I apologize for that. Starting from pre-pure puberty, that box there, is what uh, we're going to do just females here. What happens? They go through puberty just like males. Uh, but then they have something very, very different, which is uh, the, in, in pre-menopause, they have menstrual cycles. So every 28 days, there's a change in hormonal status. If they're prima paris, meaning that they never had a pregnancy, that's different. However, they could have a pregnancy. Again, hormonal changes, physiological changes, and anatomical changes. Then that, and even in the trimesters, so we're going to talk about trimesters here, the T1 is trimester one, two, and three, and you can really appreciate uh, the differences there anatomically at the very least. They have a postpartum period, which is extremely sleep depriving. There's also hormonal changes there as well. They may have a second and third pregnancy. So you can really appreciate even pre-menopausally how many changes uh, happen in a reproductive state for females. And then they go through menopause. Menopause is another transition of hormonal state uh, and, and could be quite uh, disruptive to sleep as we'll talk about in the post-menopause. Um, in in newly Paris women are women who, oh, I'm sorry, I said primary Paris is, that's the first pregnancy. Newly Paris is, never had a pregnancy, and they may just go straight to menopause at that point. So you can appreciate all the differences. And when we talk about research involving women, we have to actually consider these factors, which can be rather complex. And it's much easier to do it in, in research in males, 
uh, as a result. But in, in females, there are such complexities that we have to take all these factors into consideration when we're, when we're asking females. And clinically, quite frankly, are they menopausal? Are they postmenopausal? What happens around men, menstrual cycles, et cetera? So um, let's do the battle of the sexes. I thought this would be fun. So, <laughs> so uh, who, who has insomnia more, men or women? Women. Woman, we woman win. That's right. Who has sleep apnea more? Men. 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 So we'll talk about sort of that. Uh, who has restless legs more? Women. Men. W women. That's right. Oh. Women. And we'll talk about that. Who has REM sleep behavior disorder more? Men. Men. Yeah, it, you might say it depends <laughs> because yes, the idiopathic form. And you know, and secondary RBD is more likely in women. So we'll talk about that. This is, this is a great warm up to talk about epidemiology. So sleep disorders and gender. You can kind of see the Ten Commandment look here: women versus men, insomnia rates, sleep apnea. You can see sort of some of the things that might you might be seeing in clinic and the observations of epidemiology in terms of how much you'll see of what. Uh, but clearly, insomnia wins for women versus men. But we do see at least 50% or up to 50% of both men and women can have insomnia presenting uh, with sleep apnea. And so it's going to be very, very frequent even in both. We'll see much more um, REM sleep behavior in, in men. Uh, but I've always asked this question to the to people who are interested in REM sleep behavior disorder. When they have REM sleep disorder, men tend to be a little bit more violent, just like the parasomnias we see in boys. They, they tend to have a little bit more kind of violent presentation. I once had a woman who all her RBD was, she was doing a little bit of cooking and a little bit of singing. Actually, the singing was more annoying to her husband, but that was her acting out. It wasn't this punch hit presenting with a, you know, a, a bruise on the head. Um, and so you wonder about sort of the subtlety of RBD in women that has yet to be uh, discussed. Uh, but you can sort of see what sort of things happen. And obviously, some things are a little bit more in women than men. Uh, menstrual related hypersomnia is very, very rare. Of course, it only would occur in women. Hein Levin syndrome is more likely to be in men versus women. Again, a rare disease. Um, this is a little bit newer uh, gender differences in terms of prevalence studies. And so they pulled prevalence studies a little bit Little, probably a little bit more up to date in terms of the male to female ratio than the one I showed you before. And so this is what I wanted to share. These are sleep apnea, insomnia, and RLS. You can appreciate the sleep apnea is that that male to female ratio has come down quite a bit over the years. And so it's, it's closer uh, to men than, than we once thought, probably because we're recognizing it more, especially in postmenopausal women. And insomnia rates still women, but not 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 that much. And RLS about you know kind of double. So let's keep going with that. We're going to start first, and that's a very good segue into these three main domains: insomnia, sleep apnea, restless legs. We talk about insomnia first. I love this depiction sort of artistically because you can sort of see the man sleeping and the woman awake. <laughs> I'm sure that's not what this means, um, you know, Venus versus Mars, but that's my rendition of of the difference of insomnia here. Um, let's talk about the, the sex differences over the course of the lifespan. And so in the very beginning uh, part of chi childhood, we really don't see much in the way of sex differences. They really appear mostly after puberty. And then you'll see that sort of that change in epidemiology right around puberty, where females get more uh, than males and then that, that continues throughout adulthood. Maybe there's a little plateau, maybe not with, with men. And then, and then a really higher amount with aging, which is very typical epidemiologically. Um, so, the, so women are gonna have a lot more risk and you can see those numbers there. Women also have more comorbid insomnia. So we're more likely to have anxiety and depression, PTSD and chronic pain that contributes to that comorbid insomnia. Um, and then, of course, it's affected by reproductive status, right? So we talked about that complexity at the beginning. Let's look at that reproductive status. The National Sleep Foundation polls are really kind of nice polls that you can say, okay, what's happening in America over the course of time? How much sleep are people getting? You know, these kinds of things. And the poll that really focused on women, although women have been a part of polls, uh, obviously, but the one that focused on women 
uh, especially the postpartum uh, women, they were trying to, to test them, was, was in this 2007 uh, uh, National Sleep Foundation polls. And, and you can kind of appreciate sort of that uh, childbearing age uh, compared with pregnancy and postpartum, which is probably the, the, the very highest amount of insomnia symptoms, um, perimenopausal and then the postmenopausal. So, so insomnia symptoms are very different than a disorder. And when you do polls, it's not very clean. You don't get a clean ICSD diagnosis like you would in, in the sleep clinic. Symptoms are very different than a disorder. Disorders when it actually impacts them. So when we're looking at the literature and they talk about insomnia symptoms, they're very, very prevalent. But then who actually has a disorder, meaning it impacts them, whether it's fatigue or, uh, or mood or et cetera. And you can appreciate the chat. You can see the differences there um, as, with childbearing age versus pregnancy, perimenopausal, and postmenopausal women. And those without kids tend to have the least amount of sleep disruption. So that tells us what's the role of estrogen? Uh, what happens with estrogen? Uh, this might be a, a little complex, but I think it's a nice illustration in terms of if you take rats uh, um, and you, you take their ovaries out, and that would be uh, both of these. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Moving? No? We can yes. see it. Oh, yes, we can, see, we can it. see, okay. see it. Okay. okay, then let me try to use my mouse here. So the, uh, so uh, both of these, blue and green, are uh, over-ectomized um, over uh, adult rats. One is not given um, estradiol, which is just the vehicle here. The one is given estrogen. And um, I want to move that away. Good. And then, and so what happens with estrogen? So estrogen seems to be protective for the light phase. The light phase is when rats sleep. So they, they have a reverse than we do, right? So they sleep at night, uh, they sleep at daytime, they are awake at night or the dark phase. So, you know, light phase, they're sleeping, dark phase, they're awake. And uh, the ones with estradiol seem to be sleeping better. Uh, and awake more than those with in the blue line, which are those without estrogen. Now you take them, sleep deprive them, and what happens in their recovery sleep? Light phase again is where they're going to sleep. Notice that the estrogen, uh, the ones who are using estrogen or supplemented with estrogen, recover their sleep in that light phase better than those without estrogen. And then when they wake up, they're, they're less likely to have daytime, their daytime or dark phase, uh, wait, sleep, you know, so sleep episodes. And so the thought is that perhaps estrogen tends to consolidate, enhance the sleep-wake activity to the appropriate time of day, maybe advancing a little bit in other studies um, and, and allow some, some, uh, some sleep recovery there. Um, and if you look at other mice models, this is kind of complex, but this, this came out of a recent, uh, when we were doing um, um, a chapter with Dr. Stroll about, you know, the, the role of gender and then, you know, what could, be, what could we look at in terms of gender. Long story short, even if you take off sex steroids and you have uh, like a female XY, so you have four groups, female XY, female XX, male XX, male XY, um, you have chromosomal, seems like you have chromosomal in a sleep depriving state uh, expression of how those rats recover. Um, and so even with estrogen and other things, so there, there, there's more that we need to know about in terms of the chromosomal expression, even without sex steroids. But sex steroids do matter, so does sex chromosome, and we have more to learn about. Okay, we're going to shift gears here, and I'm going to ask you a question. Um, so, gender differences in restless legs here. So, we've, you know, we've covered insomnia. We're going to talk about restless legs. Why are there gender differences in restless legs, men versus women? Is it most, and I say mostly here, related to, because some of these factors exist. What is it mostly related to? Anyone want to take a stab? Iron deficiency. I would say iron. So, iron Iron, anything else? More menstruation, pretty much. Menstruation, perhaps. 
And there is some effect of that. It turns out to be parity or pregnancy. Let me show you why. But all of these factors can factor into restless legs, iron deficiency, obviously hormonal status, mood disorder. But if we're looking at the epidemiology and if you take all, all factors, it turns out, and I'll show you that, um, uh, well, we'll get to it. It's in a different slide. So let's talk about pregnancy first. Ekbom was the first one to actually do an RLS pregnancy study. He didn't even know he was doing it. Perhaps he did. <laughs> but they did notice that the prevalence in women who were pregnant were, was higher uh, when they were pregnant. And it turns out worldwide prevalence, I really like this study because we want to see regional differences. And, and despite all the regional differences, there, there's, there is a, probably a hormonal uh, contribution between T1, which is the first trimester of pregnancy, second and third trimester. And you, you could see that the rates of pregnancy go up with each trimester. Um, and that you could also appreciate the regional differences here. And the regional differences seem to be related to iron deficiency. And so you're gonna have a lot more. There's one study in Pakistan, for example, almost all their gender differences was related to iron you know, deficiency. But if you take all women all over the world, the gender differences seem to be related to something else, which is parity, and I'll show you that. So look at, look at this study here. So you have your secondary restless legs, which can be what, you know, renal insufficiency, uh, iron deficiency, and pregnancy. So what happens in pregnancy? Pregnancy is a state where estrogen and progesterone pro prolactin are all increasing during pregnancy, in particular in the third trimester. So perhaps there's a hormonal um, influence there. Although when they picked apart each one in some really elegant study, they couldn't pick out which hormone uh, is actually doing, you know, kind of causal there for restless legs. Uh, so um, if you take, however, pre-existing uh, restless legs, so a woman who is about to be pregnant who already has restless legs versus that which happens just during pregnancy. So at the bottom, you'll see these healthy, otherwise healthy, right? Pregnancy pre-related, um, uh, pregnancy related, excuse me, and then pre-existing, okay? And so, so you don't have pregnancy related pre-pregnancy, obviously, <laughs> pre-existing. You go into your first pregnancy and you see that there will be some that have pregnancy related only, and then the pre-existing RLS continues to have RLS. Make, and, and their studies say it gets worse during pregnancy. So that's something counseling, some counseling we could do with patients. So um, Sally, yes, I'm gonna spitball some stuff in here. So there seems to be an association between restless legs and sleep disordered breathing. Yes. And so some of these differences may just be from, rather than a hormone, is at the development of sleep disordered breathing during pregnancy and beyond with the weight gain. Yes, yes, absolutely. Good point. Um, absolutely. So those are, yeah, those are some newer studies. And I don't know if we have that, if it's proven yet, if that's the case or not, but there's an excellent point. Uh, because they did some studies with, with, with stretching and if it's, if it's weight gain and those kinds of things, and that didn't really pan out. But they haven't, to my knowledge, done the studies on hypoxia-mediated RLS, which is very, very uh, new, newer evidence. And yeah, absolutely, that could very much be the case. Um, what's, what's the difference here, I think, is this is, this is really interesting, too, right at labor, right at the start at labor, there's a precipitous fall in RLS before the baby has, you know, before delivery. Why that happens precipitately, the theory there might be hormonal because it's a precipitous fall in the hormones, precipitous, you know, sort of these resolved pregnancy state and it, but it could very well be aggravated by, you know, sleep apnea. The resolution of sleep apnea, as you know, happens after pregnancy. So why would that precipitous fall happen? I'm not sure. Um, but, but that's an excellent point and something we'll talk about because that's, that's just, just a huge topic right in and of itself. Um, the, the one thing I do want to note here is that after having a pregnancy, mean follow-up seven, seven years, there's some after having pregnancy that will develop the chronic idiopathic RLS form, even without having RLS before pregnancy. 
And so there seems to be some unveiling, if you will, in of pregnancy that tends to then augment the uh, idiopathic form. Um, we talked a little bit about this, transient RLS versus pre-pregnancy RLS, um, pregnancy secondary RLS alone, so it's not anything related. So there's a ton of other things here, iron storage, decline, stretch or compression of lumbar roots, we talked about that here, sleep disruption. This sleep deprivation, even sleep apnea, sleep apnea can do it in a way with a hypoxia needed or sleep fragmentation. But as we know in pregnancy, there could be other sleep things that fragment sleep and sleep de deprivation in and of itself can, can aggravate RLS. So there's probably all sorts of things that could then aggravate pregnancy. And then we wanna talk about nulliparous women versus uh, parous women. If you take nulliparous women, women who have never been pregnant, their rates of RLS are closer to men. And the more children seems to, although not all the studies is very, very limited data, might have more severe RLS um, if, you, if you've had more pregnancies or more, more children. And then somebody alluded to menses. And so there, are, there is a report um, around the menstrual cycle where a third of patients may report worsening symptoms. And then we also see worsening symptoms post-menopause. Oral contraceptives don't seem to have an effect on RLS. So, so there's, there's more to be discovered there. And I think uh, um, a, a very rich area for research. Um, and uh, just to point out, just for reasons that are helpful for, for all of us to remember is that some people have, and, and RLS is also known as the Ekbom, what is it, Wills Ekbom syndrome. Um, some people want to poo poo it and say it's not a bit really big deal. Um, but as we know in the sleep heart health study, we know that modern severe RLS can be associated with cardiovascular disease. And um, those with a history of pregnancy induced hypertension tended to have more RLS. Perhaps it aggravated their pregnancy state perhaps vice versa, chicken or egg, or it could be bi-directional. Um, and, and, and there seems to be some correlation at higher odds of having chronic hypertension, pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, any of these sort of hypertensive states in pregnancy, uh, if you've had some, some jumpy legs, and that, that's a little bit looser, but I think it would be helpful to sort of understand that, recognize that, and see what the research kind of evolves to uh, when it comes to RLS and hypertension. Um, it's challenging, however, to treat restless legs in pregnancy. What are you going to treat them with, right? And so um, uh, there, are, there, are, there are lots of things to consider, and sometimes you have to manage them because the restless legs are so, so bad that you have, to, you have to manage them with some other medication with the, cons with the consultation of their OB-GYN. Okay, and then obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea, this is a 1979 New England Journal of Medicine. And as we've seen recently, the New England Journal of Medicine can sometimes publish things that, <laughs> anyway. Um, at that time, the evidence showed that there was a strong male predominance, so much so that uh, women weren't really recognized of, ha of having obstructive sleep apnea. So then fast forward, to 1993, uh, where Young had her, her um, epidemiology study looking for obstructive sleep apnea and found that the, the once thought to be 8 to 10 to 1 ratio ended up being more like 2 to 3 to 1 male to female. Male predominance wasn't as strong. So then the question was, well, why? Well, why is it that women weren't being recognized to have sleep apnea? And I think I have that in a different slide. These are the current prevalence rates according to sort of more, more recent epidemiology from, um, from 2013 in the Wisconsin uh, sleep cohort. Uh, and, and we still know that there's a higher prevalence, obviously, with older women and especially menopause, obesity, and age all contribute. But if you see women and you compare side by side BMI, women and men premenopausally, uh, tend to have uh, milder, uh, milder, and milder rates of, of sleep apnea, more REM-related obesity and rares. And, and so I, I included that here. 
clinical presentation of sleep apnea in women also could make uh, be different. And so, um, for example, some women don't have your typical symptoms. They're uh, less likely to report your typical symptoms. However, snoring is still the number one symptom in women. Uh, but but they they may present with insomnia and mood disturbance. And in fact, we've seen that some, we see them all the time in sleep clinic, don't we? I've been on oh. for 20 years. <laughs> this, this, this thing gets me crazy because men and women present differently. And, and the mild sleep apnea thing, women are affected differently, but maybe affected very severely. So their sleep apnea, while classified as mild, may be extremely disruptive to their lives. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. And I wholeheartedly agree, Denise. I, I submitted a grant that I was rejected. You know what the grant people said? They said, women have milder apnea, so it's not, it's like not a big deal. And I said, whoa, time out, you know? <laughs> and and so, um, so even though there's mild, mild disease, uh, there's, uh, there's, 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 there's effect long, long term. Mm -hmm. And we see that. Thankfully, we have more evidence now to, to say that in the past, it was women don't really have sleep apnea. And if they did, it's really mild. So, you know. Well, be, because they had their criteria where you needed like the 4% decline in oxygen saturation and the 10%. And, and I even think that our current criteria are not sufficient to capture significant sleep disordered breathing in women. Because like when I look at sleep studies, I see, you know, the nasal pressure signal go and the peop, the women wake up. Young women wake up yeah. before they reach their 10 seconds. Right, right, right. And so hence the RARA thing, right? So right. I'm a big proponent of RARA scoring and... Uh, because we we do such a disservice if if we do see that and then we can't right we can't do do anything but about it even a rara requires ten seconds <laughs> right right that's that's true that's true right you gotta you gotta get really you gotta get really close <laughs> I, I remember reading looking at one study where this young woman she she wanted an inspire she went to to uh, Amy she's like I, I I have bad sleep apnea this is killing me I need an inspire and when she got a sleep study her HI was zero and Amy was like oh my god. And so I looked at the study and, and she had frequent arousals and before each arousal, there was a flattening, there was like clear flow limitation and she, yeah. up, but yeah. she never made it to 10 seconds. Which, oh, and she wasn't CMS or anything either, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And those patients, I have a low threshold of, of repeating their studies. I've repeated studies on women several times until I get, <laughs> I get what I need. <laughs> Oh, the ones that are patient with me. I'm like, look, there's some here. We're not. Yeah. Right. There has to, there's probably some, there's a subset of women that just fall through the cracks, right? And then they reemerge in postmenopause. Right. Boom. Right. Then, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we can finally, finally detect right. them. But they do, they have that sleep disordered breathing. They have it. And, you know, so even from our own scoring. And we know, though, that women do, women who have sleep apnea, have a higher diabetes incidence even compared to men. Why is that, right? So what is, so, so that could go after the, the fragmented sleep that's happening. We know that fragmented sleep alone, sleep deprivations alone can increase your propensity to having insulin resistant states. So there's something there uh, about that. And then if you treat these women, they definitely have an improvement. Even the REM related, I had a debate about REM related sleep apnea with somebody. There's evidence to say what even with REM related you do have an improvement in function, mood, sleepiness, and outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and a newer study, which I thought was really interesting, so take chronic insomnia disorder and women versus men. You treat them, women were more likely to respond to PAP. And that tells me a lot about that insomnia presentation. And so that subset of insomnia presentation is really responding to sleep right. when they have sleep apnea. Um, more likely, more likely than men doesn't mean that men won't respond too. We know that insomnia states in men are comorbid almost half the time, so it's really important to recognize it. But I thought that was an interesting study to share. That's a great one. Yeah. Um, and so, looking for th this, I put together in for an OB Gen conference. You know, who is high risk women in your in your group? Um, and, and we're learning a lot more about pregnancy. Uh, where it hasn't been recognized um, in the past, but central obesity, especially women with PCOS, um, any women really with insulin resistance, you want to sort of say, hmm, maybe. And then the uh, peri postmenopausal state, when they're presenting mostly with insomnia, thinking about them. And a lot of people will say, gosh, well, I'm thin. 
I may not have sleep apnea, so we have to really think about other factors. And I didn't put, I had another slide of retrocathins and craniofacial abnormalities that we, we will be looking for in sleep clinics. And here's a prevalence. I think I have this, but this is a nice little visual. Men versus women and, um, you know, uh, um, anyway. So why are they different? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a, the gender differences for sleep apnea. And I don't know if Dr. Stroll is on or not. This is where, this is his baby. So lots of reason that there could be differences besides sex hormone by itself. We know upper airway instability, PCRIT is a little bit different. Uh, there, there's no difference in PCRIT. There's a difference in, um, um, I'm, I'm blanking, 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 and I'll get it in a second. Um, so, so, having, so having upper airway collapsibility, what is that from? But it's more likely to occur in men versus women. There could be an effect on sex hormone, and there is on uh, the pharyngeal dilator muscles. Uh, Postmenopause, that seems that higher collapsibility is there, uh, and hence the reason why we see more <laughs> postmenopause. But there's also differences in, in, in anatomy. Um, some, some of the, you know, we, we talk about location, location, location. Where is fat distribution? It's not typically kind of bulking in the neck area. It might be lower down for women. Um, and, and then a ton of other kind of control mechanisms, uh, arousal response, and some other things that will affect the, the apnea threshold. And then pre-menopause, what's happening in pregnancy? I want, I, I really, I would really want to talk about this. We talked about the menstrual cycles. I don't think you thought you'd end your sleep, fellas, should talk about, talk about the menstrual cycle. <laughs> so let's talk, let's talk about this. What is this rhythm called? In the chat? Oh, good. Dr. Stroll, power just back on. Okay, good. So uh, chime in, anybody. Who, what is this rhythm called? I talked about this in our, I think, our beginning lecture. Let's see if you remember. Anybody? The ovulatory cycle. It's close to circadian. I'm trying to remember the, name, the word. Oh, right, right. So yeah, between, so circadian rhythm is circa being di, di, uh, circa dia circle around the day, so that's 24 hours. Then you have your infradia rhythm. Ultradian? Ultradian ultra rhythm. And so this, this one is the, uh-oh, hold on. And before we go on, because I don't want to give, I think both of them come up here as the answer, where, which, if you look at this, follicular phase, luteal phase, progesterone being blue, estrogen being green, ovulation right in the middle, where do you think breathing would be protective for women? Ovulatory phase. During high progesterone. During high progesterone. So the luteal phase, right, right here. And so this seems to be a protective time uh, for women. And this is the infradian uh, rhythm, okay. So biological rhythms, this will be on your boards, and this is something that we love in sleep medicine. We love rhythms. We love biological rhythms. There's clocks all over the body, and we in sleep medicine really like, we're probably uh, one of the few specialties who ask over and over again, what time do you take your medications? The, you, we want to know if it's 8 or 8.30 or 9 o'clock or 9.30. Well, what does it matter? It's my melatonin. Yes, it matters, right? So timing is so critical uh, when we talk about even dosing of medication. Circa, the circadian rhythm is the 24-hour day. The ultradian, ultra is faster than a day. So ultra, you know, do, 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 the, that cycles, 90 to 120 minutes is an example of that with the REM, non-REM cycle. And then uh, infradian, shorter than a day, um, is the menstrual cycle. It's longer, excuse me, longer than a day, right? Sure, no, not as fast, longer than a day is your infradian rhythm, more, more than a day, um, which is your menstrual cycle. And it's really unique to women. Um, and so when, when we talk about, and this is too complex here, let's talk about what happened. And I love this study. Uh, it's a 1999 study, but it's a really, it's a good one. Um, and we, what we see here between the follicular and the luteal phase, remember the luteal phase is the one with high progesterone. So is it not surprising that we then see a lower AHI compared to the follicular stage? And I've always been so mesmerized by this study because you can actually, if you have a mild sleep apnea, 
look at that, moderate versus severe. If you have a mild sleep apnea, would you even miss it if you checked them in the luteal phase? Um, and so it's always been sort of a curiosity to me. It's a very hard thing to study though. A lot of women are on oral contraceptives and we really don't know, you know, if, you know how much progesterone at any given time. You really have to do, do, a, to do a ton of this. But what's really interesting is, is that it, it does matter uh, in terms of what, when, you, when, you, when you test them. And there's a protective role of progesterone, so it increases ventilatory chemoresponsiveness. Dr. Stroll actually did, I think, a study um, with progesterone, mostly in men. This was in the 1990s, if he's on, I uh, would be love, love to hear it, because I've never really asked him ab about it, but I've seen his name on many papers, one of which was the uh, progesterone paper. Um, and, and so we know that it, it helps with ventilation. We, we also know this is not just unique to sleep. They've done a study, um, I think it was at the clinic, uh, along with other people who looked at pulmonary function tests, luteal phase versus follicular phase. And guess what? Luteal phase was a better time for PFTs than the follicular phase. This is, it's, it's all about ventilation. It's likely progesterone that's, uh, that's driving it. Unique to sleep is the pharyngeal dilator muscles. We see that that postmenopausal women are less likely to have that activity, likely related to the loss of uh, sex hormones, especially progesterone. Menstrual effects also affect sleep EEG. It's no surprise it'll probably affect a lot of things. So the earlier studies looked at men versus women on their sleep EEG, and what would be the difference here? What would be the difference? And if you look real closely, um, if you take menstrual effects into account, that's where you might, might see the difference. And so there's only one slide here. I, I, I went through in another talk, sort of REM and non-REM and other things. I think the most striking is REM, and that's why I'm looking at it here. So again, if you test a woman in their, progest in their luteal phase where progesterone is protective and they have less REM sleep, you may not capture sleep apnea. This is why I have a low threshold of repeating studies in my patients that are women. Um, other effects on EEG, there doesn't seem to be effect in slow wave sleep, no, no change in sleep latency or efficiency. There are changes in REM sleep, changes in non-REM too, especially with sleep spindles. And I think you get cut off here, but there's some EEG variation across the menstrual effect, the menstrual cycle. So it's no surprise that, the, that women will perceive some differences in their sleep across the menstrual cycle, subjectively. And then of course we saw objectively. And in a poll, uh, 33, about a third of women will, will, will describe some kind of sleep disturbance around their menstrual cycle. And if you say, where is the worst sleep? It seems to be uh, the, the, the late luteal phase. So when progesterone is coming off, so pre, sort of premenstrually. And they may not just describe like poor sleep quality, but they, they can have hypersomnia, insomnia. It's all over the map in terms of what they might feel. Objectively, we talked about EEG, but there's also circadian temperature decline. Uh, we're not going to go into that. But there's differences uh, objectively um, in circadian rhythmicity and circadian temperature changes and effects on breathing. And that leads us to reproduction and sleep. And so these, we're still talking about these um, uh, childbearing age women. Um, we know that there's a higher prevalence in polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, and that might have effects on reproduction. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> there's, a, there's a pending paper uh, that we are still in the process of writing up. Uh, we didn't really see much uh, higher prevalence of sleep apnea. Guess what we saw? We saw more prevalence of insomnia in these women. But we know that women can, can present with insomnia, so it's an interesting uh, correlation. Um, and uh, and we know that women who have irregular shifts tend to have more irregular menstruation, shift workers, and there's a loosey-goosey kind of research association with shift workers and reported outcomes such as, you know, pregnancy-related outcomes and prematurity. Some studies, however, in residents didn't find any changes on, uh, you know, re reproductive health, and so more, more to come. And there could be two reasons, and one could be, you know, the, the actual circadian rhythm itself or the, the function of sleep deprivation in those irregular shifts, where we, can, we know that there, there's definite effects um, on, uh, on reproductive hormones. Okay, and so this might be a summary slide. 
in terms of polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, I really like this study. It was a really elegant study by the Van Carter group, who does a lot of research in metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance states, et cetera. And if you look at um, if we look at the prevalence of uh, insulin uh, resistance, so impaired glucose tolerance at the top and the home IR at the bottom, um, you can see those without sleep apnea in the yellowish kind of thing right here. Um, their rates are much lower than those with PCOS who don't have sleep apnea, but guess what? With, with PCOS and mild, moderate, and severe sleep apnea, we see a dose-dependent relationship uh, with having uh, more insulin resistance state according to the degree of sleep apnea. So it would, it would behoove us to be looking for sleep apnea in those uh, at high risk for obstructive sleep apnea. The PCOS women are, are definitely there. And they have long-term, very high morbidity and cardiovascular risk. So this might be sort of one of the underpinnings of those risks. And then sleep and pregnancy. Um, lots of changes anatomically, physiologically, hormonally. What happens across pregnancy? Um, and if this is too much information, just stop me and ask questions, please. So we can take some brain breaks if you need to. Um, and so first trimester, right when there's a high amount of placental growth, um, there is a lot more sleep deprivation. That's probably mostly due to rapid, rapid, rapid um, increase in progesterone and estrogen as the placenta grows. By the second trimester, sleep duration normalizes typically. So even you know if they're napping a lot, they're very, very tired, that's very, very normal. And then we get to the second trimester and it should normalize a little bit. And then it goes downhill from there. So third trimester, loss of sleep, and that's typically related to other things like nocturnal awakenings, uh, sleep, sleep efficiency is, is largely affected. There's a dec decline in slow wave sleep. And there's a myriad of things that happen uh, with that third trimester. Uh, urinary frequency is one uh, of those. And so there's, there's, we know sleep across pregnancy will be changing uh, for a second and third trimester. We also equally know that early and late pregnancy is very different in terms of how they present with sleep disturbances. And so if you take those sleep disturbances and then look at primary sleep disorders, insomnia, restless legs, snoring, uh, you will see an increase in the prevalence of some of these things. And you will see uh, shorter sleep duration go down. So one of, the, one of the challenges here is to identify sleep disorders. How do we do that in pregnancy? And then how do you help these patients who have primary sleep disorders? Uh, in the, it, it, early on, it was thought that pregnant women didn't have sleep apnea because they actually have an increase in progesterone and estrogen. And so they thought, well, this is protective potentially, right? Because it's hormonal, but it's not. Uh, and, and in fact, if, if they do have sleep disturbance of any kind, they're more likely to have gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, in, in objective and, ob and subjective studies, uh, with snoring women and those who have um, who have uh, sleep apnea, much more likely to have um, odds of of having gestational diabetes, for example. So it's not protective against sleep apnea. Snoring increases over pregnancy, postpartum um, tends to resolve, but not all the time. In the first prospective cohort, as uh, you know, there are maybe 10% of women in the first trimester, and guess what? Third trimester it goes up, it more than doubles. Uh, and so the question is, the challenge is, do you, do you keep testing women do you, or do you just have a vigilance to them? We know that OB-GYN have a lot on their plate. Uh, to, they're looking for this or that and this and that. By the third trimester, you know, they're, they're doing some pregnancy planning, but their poor sleep could be sleep apnea. And then how do we, how do we help, help them with that? And there's many, many reasons, gravid uterus, airway edema, weight gain, um, among other things. Uh, but it's really important because uh, we, we have uh, preeclampsia. This was for the OB-GYN group, but I wanted you guys to see sort of the, some of these rates here, the odds ratios being very high for moderate obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and so if a woman has mild sleep apnea going into her pregnancy, um, it's going to get worse. And, and treating that is going to be very, very helpful, hopefully. Uh, we don't have the studies yet, but uh, for, for some of these things. We do have, we have to do some, some studies. 
lots, these are sort of some cohort studies looking at the relative risk for a myriad of things, preeclampsia, preterm birth, higher rate of C-section and NICU admission. Um, some studies look at SGA babies and other studies say that they exist. Some say they don't. This, these, this you know, some cohort studies say they don't. And so um, if you have the diabetic babies, they tend to be, you know, bigger. And so does it wash out? It's not clear. Um, but some, some studies do say there's SGA babies as well. With, uh, with preeclampsia, uh, without, uh, with preeclampsia and sleep apnea, without preeclampsia and sleep apnea, we see some key differences in the blood pressure response to, uh, to a, 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 a response to a partial stop in breathing or a full stop in breathing. And we know that, we know that there's increases in sympathetic activity, um, increases in blood pressure and heart rate. We see that more robustly in those who have preeclampsia and sleep apnea. Um, so, so there's there's a there's some effects of sleep apnea, but that combination um, is is much more uh, robust. So we really, really, really have to treat some of these women with with a comorbid illness. And some of the interactions are shown here, where there's episodic hy hypoxia leading to sympathetic activation, hypertension, preeclampsia, some of the inflammatory and endothelial function, which is which is an underpinning of preeclampsia. Um, we may have placental ischemia or airway edema in both sleep apnea and preeclampsia that then aggravate each other, perhaps. Uh, these are some mechanisms. We also see maternal fetal outcome. Um, and I'm going to be running out of time, so I'm going to keep going here. Uh, fetal ultrasound uh, changes with sleep apnea. So it is going to affect the baby. Um, interestingly, fetal monitoring, if you're putting on a time-synchronized PSG along with a fetal heart rate monitor, you can see terrible, terrible apnea and you don't, it doesn't pick up on a fetal heart rate monitor. They're so resilient. These babies are so resilient. But there's something happened on the placenta level and the fetal markers because we are seeing changes in fetal markers and fetal ultrasound and we are seeing um, enhanced fetal erythropoiesis and we're seeing under perfusion in the placental lining here. So there's lots of studies that say something's happening to the baby too. Uh, it may not always manifest uh, acutely. Amen. So if you're called to the ob -GYN department, you can't get your CPAP from your DME because you have to run through hoops. You don't have a home sleep apnea test in the hospital because your hospital doesn't want to pay for it. <laughs> what do you do? You can, you can, you can, there's a nice study looking at, get them up, you know, erase the head of the bed up. Randomized crossover, it's actually helpful. And sometimes treating uh, half of these patients in this one study. So, so if you can't do anything else, get these, get these uh, and if they're admitted with preeclampsia, you know, they're laying down flat and you, you're consulting. This is a good time to get that head of the butt up uh, while you try to, try to help them out. And then there's, some, there's a randomized control trial with CPAP treating sleep apnea and improving, improving glucose and diabetes. This is where it's going to be at, where, where once we show some of these studies and we, we're starting to see them, uh, that gestational diabetes could potentially be um, counteract with uh, the treatment of sleep apnea. And we know all these wonderful things are tailored to women. Uh, even some men like these things. And I'm running out of time. The last group is the forgotten group, the, the aging and postmenopausal. They're the highest risk for everything, short sleep duration, Hot flushes can play a role, but it's not the only thing in menopause. Um, but just know this, that in, in sleep, sleep apnea, uh, the rates are very high for uh, postmenopausal women, and the rates of postmenopause are closer to that of men. Uh, and so this group is a very high risk group. Um, if they are on hormone replacement therapy, their rates tend to be like premenopausal women, not so, not so much, but the rate is closer to that. In this study, very close. Um, and so there's some effect of hormone replacement therapy, obviously not going to treat sleep apnea with it, but for those on it, safely on it, uh, potentially to help with the sleep apnea. Another study, just to remember, night sweats. If a woman comes in saying, I sweat, I sweat, my hot flushes are worse at night. Um, night sweats, more often, uh, if they're highly frequent, can be, can be associated with sleep apnea. Something to think about. Um, so these are- Not TB. <laughs> Not, not TB, not TB. <laughs> you don't have TB, you might have sleep apnea. 
especially, especially these widowed women who don't snore. There's one study about wi widowed women and they just present with insomnia and they have all these night sweats and you know, they, they, they've got sleep apnea and they'll prove it otherwise. Um, so it's rather complex in women. Sleep in the female lifespan is just a very complex, very wonderful area of, of research in my mind. Um, there's circadian pacemakers all over the body. They can be affected by ovarian hormones and some other things. And we know about these hormonal differences. There's more uh, we have to uh, understand about these women. Um, and the presentation of sleep disorders, namely sleep apnea, can be very different to women versus men. Um, and around these biological transitions, so I, I would encourage everybody to ask, when, 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 you're, when this started, was it around menopause? Sometimes you have to poke and prod. And when, oh yeah, yeah, it was in my 50s. That's right. You know, so, you know, they may not piece it together, but biological transitions can be a very key area where things are, are changing for women. And that is it. That was awesome, Sally. Oh, great. I'm glad you liked it. Dr. Abram, I have a quick question. Um, so the, the very interesting topic, and then, uh, so we're seeing obviously a ton of uh, obvious differences in sort of manifestation of, you know, disorders such as sleep apnea based on biological sex. And I'm kind of wondering, I'm on a national level or a, you know, AASM level, are there discussions, have there been discussions about, you know, kind of the diagnostic criteria and, you know, possibly taking into account these biological differences? I mean, I'm just sort of curious how it's being addressed kind of on a guideline level, if at all. I think that's a good question. I'm not aware of any guidelines that say with, with that specification, there are multiple papers who highlight the differences in presentation, but I'm not aware specifically of a guideline that would say this or that. And there's quite frankly not so much in terms of, for example, the menstrual cycle thing. There's not a guideline there because there's really no evidence to say, and this is where I got an interest in, in <laughs> into it, to say if you tested a woman here versus there, do you get a different? There's that one paper but there's not one that says you'd miss a diagnosis. You know, you just might get a little level, little, little level difference of an AHI, for example. And so I think we probably need more studies to suggest to, to really highlight that in a, in a guideline per se, because there's that not that a guidelines that level A evidence, and I don't know if we have all that level A evidence, but right. we do have great evidence to say that the presentation is very different, especially with sleep apnea. Right, that makes sense. Good question. I, I, I'm not I aware. Think we, Are you aware? That, no, and that's a really, that is really a great question because this is going to be something that we're going to have to change the way we diagnose sleep apnea in order to, to, to capture these women with mild sleep disordered breathing who are actually significantly symptomatic. And that's going to have to, we're going to have to like look at sleep studies and see how they correlate with depression, but we're going to have to, and, and you know, all these other things that women present with and we're going to have to to court, like really look closely at the flow signal rather than rely on oxygen saturation and you know whatever automated things we're doing there really needs to be some basic research correlating yeah. symptoms with changes in airflow right right and and maybe there's something on an EEG level and that's as you know right. you wonder about uh, in, in your patient that you were highlighting you wonder about is there something happening on an arousal threshold there is it measurable? I mean, that's how right. one of the things we have in children is motor restlessness. It's there's uh, Del Rosso is really looking at that. And it wasn't described before, but you see it all the time. And some children are su super restless. And then mm -hmm. it turns out she just came up with a strategy to look for that. And she, she identified the motor restless index or what, what she's calling it. I can't remember what she's calling it. And it turns out that that's correlated with iron deficiency, the same way restless legs is. And when you treat these children, they get better. We see them clinically all the time. And, and, it, and it just takes a little stab at, how could we measure this differently? And if we can measure it differently, does it make an impact? And I think we, just, we might have to be creative on how we do that. And, and that might point to your uh, point, Beck, is there how to, and then that might inf influence guideline and, and how we do things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. <laughs>